the Tennessee State University Research Farm where we're looking at this ancient Mexican crop that we call amaranth. Now this is a fantastically beautiful crop, but it has all kinds of agricultural significance. Now, Dr. Blair, tell me a little bit about amaranth and why we should love it, besides the fact it's beautiful. <laughs> of course, it comes in a variety of colors and that makes it a, almost an or ornamental crop, but it's actually one of the pseudo grains. It's different than cereal in that it has no gluten, but it's hugely high in protein and that protein means that it's very good for you. It really is the next quinoa. Quinoa has become popular with a lot of uh, shoppers that are going to more vegetarian lifestyles. And if you use amaranth, I assure you, it'll be just as good as uh, the quinoa. And it's a new crop for uh, Tennessee. Well, you all are doing something really special down here where you're doing some trials. Right, what we've got here is diversity of the crop collected by the U.S. Department of Agriculture and they've always trialed them in Iowa and this is the first time that we're looking at them in Tennessee and that's why you can see so much diversity in the flower color from yellow to pink to orange and red and even purple. And I know that you have some that are small and some that are tall. Are there different agricultural benefits of the sizes? Yeah, that's definitely true. This is a good crop for the home gardener because you can transplant it and then it'll grow into one of these medium-sized plants or it will grow into one of the giants that we see. Julie, we have a deep purple amaranth and one of the incredible things about this is that this produces a pigment that is very good for people's health and it can make your iced tea purple. So it has a water-soluble tinge that will come out in the tea when you uh, either brew it or put it in the sun and it will be a bright red, reddish purple. It's all due to the substance which is called betaen, and it's in these seed heads. So not only can you use the grain, but you can use the flour and you can use, in some cases, the leaves for cooking vegetables. Well, while you're talking about that color, you know, this reminds me of beets. Uh-huh, that's correct, because this is actually from the beet family. So it's unique in being like the beet, very good for you, full of antioxidants, and also having these beautiful colors. Where exactly are we going to be finding the grains, and what is the harvesting procedure for it? Okay, so right now you can buy um, uh, small packages, usually from Native Seeds, or Seed Savers Exchange has it online. Um, uh, they have a limited number of varieties, so you won't see all the diversity that we have here with some of the pink varieties and some of the yellow varieties, uh, some of the orange. Actually, there's three species related to amaranths, and so those species are diverse enough that they cover a lot of the U.S. in terms of growing in dry conditions or growing in, in rainy conditions like the summer we've had. So the basic place to get the seed lots is small amount and then save a little bit of your own seed, I'd say. The seed heads can be crushed to get the small seed out and then it can be winnowed by just removing some of the chaff and then you have the nice seed there. And that seed, when it's dry, will actually pop. So you can see seed on both sides. Well, Dr. Blair, I often think of amaranth as being this very, very tall plant, similar to this corn that's behind us, but I've seen a lot of different varieties here. For sure. Um, so as we were talking about Seed Savers Exchange, that great organization that provides uh, seed for American heritage uh, plants, um, they provided us with a, a trial that we can do with multiple rows, and that's what we've got shown here with this nice orange variety, another purple variety, and several others. And you can see that they vary in size. They vary, some are tall and some are rather short. And we've brought this as a project for Ranjita Thapa, who's from Nepal, which actually currently holds the number one spot in producing amaranth in the world. Well, tell us a little bit about that student project. Well, now I'm doing uh, genetic diversity analysis using markers, and we see some morphological characteristics uh, by analyzing the morphological differences among different genotypes. We can see the variation among the different genotypes in terms of uh, leaf color, inflorescence size, inflorescence color, then height of the plants, so that uh, Later, for further breeding purpose, we can select the best variety among them to produce uh, uh, a high-yielding amaranth. 
Wow, so amaranth is going to be a very important crop in a lot of places in the world. Not only can it produce a seed, it can also be used for forage and leafy vegetables. And leafy vegetables. So this is a multi-purpose crop. And even the seeds are gluten-free, so that's uh, in terms of nutritional view, it's very good compared right. to other grains. So you have a gluten-free grain, yeah. you have a leafy crop, mm -hmm. and you have something that animals could eat as well. Yeah. And you have high protein for those people that are looking for a substitute mm -hmm. to the high starch cereals like uh, rice and, and bread, wheat, and, and even corn. So compared to the corn that we have in the background, here we have a new crop that grows on poor soils, grows under drought conditions, and is a crop of the future. Well, Dr. Blair, I'm seeing here a couple of different kinds of amaranth, and they're much shorter, so this must be part of your trial gardens. Correct. This is a, actually a really novel experiment because it's the semi-dwarf type of amaranth, and semi-dwarfs have been the key to mechanization of almost every crop. So it used to be that our wheats, our ryes, our barleys grew very tall, and people hand-sickled them. But then when machines came along, they needed short plants. So this is an experiment that we're doing with Iowa State University. And it's a very special type of amaranth because it only grows about two and a half feet tall. Well, in this case, I'm seeing the thicker amaranth down there. And then also this one here with the multi, I guess, multi branches on it. That's the greatest part about this is that if it has multi branches, it's more resistant to lodging, which is falling over with the rain. So this plant here, so if I had about an acre of it, what am I going to be getting out of there? So you'd probably be getting about two tons, and so that'd be 2,000 pounds of grain, and that grain can be popped, so it can be used for desserts, it can be used for just regular cooking, it can be used in breads, it can be ground down as a flour, and then substitute for uh, all your pastries and, and desserts as well. Wow, fantastic. And then also if I had, oh, I guess what, chickens, maybe pigs, they could eat the rest of it? Yeah, that is uh, one of the main benefits is that pigs don't mind eating the nice soft leaves and chickens will peck at the grain. And so it's a great backyard crop for now. Fantastic. And I guess what you're finding out here really is just how well adapted it's going to be to these hotter areas? Well, one thing that it has is a special metabolism that is unique among the two-leafed non-grass species, which is that it is a highly efficient photosynthesis that is unique among the dicotyledonous plants. So basically compared to beans and compared to carrots, compared to tomatoes, this can produce a lot more biomass than those other plants. So that's why it really will be the crop of the future for high temperature and for perhaps less rain and we know that with climate change we need to adapt so we need to think about diversity and new crops. And luckily the Mexicans developed this and they developed it as perhaps maybe the fourth sister after the three sisters that we're all familiar with, corn, maize and gourds and this was really something that supplemented their diets in the past and could come back to help us in modern day agriculture. These fields that you've seen so far have never been sprayed for any of the insects and that's one of our breeding goals is to look at what kind of diseases might come to the plants and, and how well each variety resists that disease or that insect pest. Well these trial gardens are certainly very important for home gardeners and for farmers as well. It's a way to introduce new varieties and especially with new crops you really need to start from scratch, hopefully releasing a variety either with Iowa State, as we've seen for these varieties that are short, or some of the taller varieties that are um, with the USDA. We can do a good job in terms of uh, selecting a crop for the future, varieties for the future. Well, thank you so much for having us out here to see the research farm and to see what our new favorite crop will be. Great, thank you, Julie.